Nicholas Bremborg, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Thank you very much for having me. You're joining us from uh, beautiful Copenhagen. Yes, indeed. Which is where you've been studying, and we'll get to the details of your book in a moment, which you wrote uh, while you were conducting your studies there. But I think it might be useful just to start off by talking about this phrase, the fountain of youth. It means different things to different people. When you hear that expression, what do you think of? Is it a quest to live forever, or is it just a, a quest to live for as well as we can, for as long as we can? Well, of course, there's, al there's always the, you know, the dreamer in you that wants to see just how far we can take this stuff. But I would say, uh, at least from engaging a little with the science and stuff, we're probably still at the point where we should be thankful for progress in general. Uh, th then let's see what we can, uh, we can get from it. I, I obviously hope I have a long career where I can uh, um, contribute in this field. So... Who knows if we dream uh, what can happen, but right now uh, there's still some, I would say, fundamental stuff that we need to get settled. And aging itself, there are so many different definitions of what aging is. And, and of course, we hear anti-aging, anti-aging all the time. And uh, I think we're bombarded with commercials these days from various different places uh, to encourage us to do things that will turn the clock back for ourselves. But for a lot of people, aging is just a chronological process. It is something that moves forward with the days and the months and the years. So I'm curious to know where you stand on aging. What does that word mean to you? Well, to me, it means the physical decline that tends to happen in organisms, biological organisms over time. Uh, that doesn't necessarily have to happen, but that we see in, yeah, uh, organisms from mice to whales, basically. Uh, so this physical deterioration uh, where your body stops functioning uh, like it did at its peak uh, and which eventually increases your risk of diseases and also just r increases your risk of uh, you're not really have, having a lot of well-being. So let's go back to the beginning for you. I, I mentioned that you wrote this book while you were studying. What in the first place got you interested in aging? Well, I really like, uh, of course, when you study uh, biomedical stuff, uh, you, fi you have to find some you know, niche, you have to find something that you're going to study, uh, some uh, thing you're going to specialize in. And what I like about aging research in general is just this fact that, yes, we can try to cure cancer. Pra practically, if we would cure any type of, uh, every type of cancer or dementia or heart disease but at the end of the day even if we cure these diseases first of all we'll still have an old body uh, so if we cure one disease there's the risk of getting the other one uh, but then still even if we could somehow magically make every disease disappear we wouldn't uh, you would still not be as well at this point in your life as you've been uh, previously so i like that the number one risk factor for all these diseases by far is aging uh, so it just makes this like deeper form of sense that you go to the root of the problem uh, to begin with. Because, you know, someone my age who's uh, 27, I don't suddenly get dementia. I uh, don't get a heart attack. I have a very low risk of most types of cancers. So clearly, at some point, the body is naturally able to protect itself against this stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was basically this observation that I think we should we should go all the way uh, to the root of this problem and attack it there. And that would also um, allow me to, to have a career where I could maybe uh, contribute to, uh, to do the most good. And tell me about your studies. What are you specializing in? Yeah, so I did uh, what's called uh, the program that's called Molecular Biomedicine at the University of uh, Copenhagen uh, and a program called Biotechnology, which is... Um, you know, mostly different in name. There's a lot of the same courses and, and, and so stuff uh, involved. Uh, and then uh, once this, I was supposed to start this, uh, my PhD actually uh, back in time uh, a year ago, but then when my book came out and it just went absolutely crazy, you know, with translations into 26, uh, 26 different languages and all this stuff, then um, 
I talked to my advisor and she was like, okay, take a, take a year, see what you can get from this. And then uh, you're free to come back after that and, and start your studies there. So that's what, I, uh, what I've just done. And what was the impetus? What was the reason for writing a book while you're studying, or at least uh, the, starting the process while you're studying? It's something that someone in your line of work in longevity research might do 20 or 30 years into their career. You've done it right at the beginning. Yes. I mean, first, what I wanted to do was to just take a course in aging science at the University of Copenhagen. But, you know, we don't have that. It's not, not actually an uh, opportunity or an option. So I started just reading a little by myself, you know, reading some reviews and stuff. But quickly, that seems kind of futile. You just sit there and you read and then what? So I started, you know, taking some notes and yeah, one thing led to the other. And I was like, I think uh, there's a lot of good information here that normal people don't really uh, know. And it's a very, very important problem. So then I decided, OK, um, all of this, I can turn it into a book. Um, I really, really like writing and really enjoy it like as a hobby as well. Uh, so if I could then combine uh, the fact that I wanted to get up to uh, speed on everything longevity uh, science wise and then I also enjoyed writing then I, th I thought writing a book would be yeah um, a fun thing to do um, then while I was writing we also hit the pandemic so even though I did courses you know you sit at home a lot of the time and doesn't really take uh, up all of your day uh, to be honest so then yeah, I had even more time to finish this project. It is a book that's written with a, a critical eye. You, you cover a, a lot of different bases in terms of longevity science. There's, there's some history in there, there's, there's current science as well. But you are quite skeptical in many respects in terms of uh, which developments might actually have a, a meaningful practical impact on human beings if we were to apply the science to ourselves and especially the the comparison with research that's done on on rodents and mice and, and rats in the, the laboratory which i know a lot of people are, are skeptical about saying well you know, mice are not human beings did you deliberately want to set out to really pull apart the research and offer a, a very sort of practical realistic approach to longevity yeah, I, I mean, I started out completely uh, with a blank slate, right? And uh, of course, at that point, I'd already uh, been reading a lot about this stuff. So had a lot of uh, expectations and, and stuff. But then I basically just tried to read as much as possible um, tried to look at, at as much data as possible and then make up my own mind about what I thought about this stuff. And it turns out that just like in every field of science, some of the stuff is maybe not that robust when you dive into it. Um, and some of the stuff maybe turns out to be better than you thought initially uh, when you then dive into it. But I don't really, I don't really have like, I don't really have like a, a feeling that I should, uh, you know, I just want to learn the truth. So I don't have, I don't feel like uh, if something is not the truth uh, about aging, it doesn't really help me get any closer to my goal. So I just wanted to actually uh, see that. And of course, I think it's a good thing when you want to go into science. I think it's a good thing to look at stuff skeptically, especially also once you try doing a few experiments yourself and stuff like that. I mean, it's really, really, really hard to learn things in general in biology because it's so complicated. So of course, not everything that's being done is perfect. And then the problem is also that the, the, you know, the body is so complex that it's way easier to accidentally harm yourself than it is to find something that will actually benefit you. So if you're not critical, you will end up, while trying to actually live longer, you might end up shortening your own lifespan. And that seems... Uh, it seems not, like not the best use of time if you uh, really, really start nerding out about this stuff and then it actually only ends up producing a shorter lifespan uh, for you. I think that's a really interesting point. What is it that doctors say, do no harm first when you're trying to treat a, a condition? And I know from my experience looking at the, all the, the diff, many of the different interventions, one thing that I've, over a period of time, come to believe is that, and it sounds quite boring, but that moderation 
in everything is actually probably one of the best longevity interventions that we can apply to ourselves because there are so many different interventions, whether it's supplementation or diet or extreme exercise. Any of these elements in extreme or excess can and probably are most likely to cause harm than good, at least in the short term. I mean, uh, I, at least with the stuff we have now, I completely agree that uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff where uh, if your goal is actually to live as long as possible, you don't want to double down on some random drug right now that doesn't really have safety data behind it and then just cross your fingers and hope that, uh, you know, the papers are, are what they say they are. So I would definitely also, uh, if you actually have this practical mindset of wanting to, to, to live as long as possible, it makes perfect sense to not just jump onto every single new discovery before uh, it has had its time to get tested in multiple places and uh, really thoroughly uh, uh, vetted so you don't end up uh, yeah kind of on the wrong side of, uh, of this thing. So let's look at the title of the book, Jellyfish Age Backwards. You've got an intriguing first section of the book where you talk about the animal kingdom and what we can learn from different species. Uh, let's focus in on the jellyfish story first. Do some jellyfish literally age backwards? Yeah, so the, the jellyfish I'm referring to in this, uh, in this title is a special species that's called the Turritopsis dorni, uh, which is this tiny jellyfish the size of a fingernail. And if you just look at this jellyfish, uh, it's, you know, it's not the most exciting animal ever. It's just a little jellyfish that swims, swims around eating plankton. But then if you stress this jellyfish by, for instance, changing the temperature of the water, or uh, you can do it by mechanical damage, then you can actually get it to go from its adult stage back to something called the polyp stage. So it would be a little bit akin to taking a butterfly and turning it into a caterpillar again, for instance. Then from there, the jellyfish can grow up anew and you can practically repeat this rejuvenation step. Um, I don't remember exactly uh, what's the maximum amount of time it's been done, but it's been done at least 10 times uh, where it works. So if there isn't a, a limit to this, it's practically an example of, you know, the holy grail of aging research. So that's an animal that's actually biologically immortal. That's, it's interesting. Uh, and there are other animals you, you write about a lot, uh, and those especially that are used in laboratories for longevity research. I've mentioned already rats and mice are probably the most common. There's something called a, a mole rat uh, as well that longevity researchers uh, are very interested in. W what's the reason for that? So the thing is, in the beginning of the book, I tried to look out and, and see like, uh, well, is aging uh, something that's set in stone? Because of course, then it would be foolish to even try to, to do anything about it. But you pretty quickly learn that, yes, for instance, you see many of the same changes in an in old mouse as you see in, a, in an old person. It just happens at vastly different speeds. Then you also learn that there are animals that can live way longer than us, so where we are kind of the mouse. And, you know, at the point where they're still young and fit, we uh, start to show all these uh, classic signs of aging. For instance, it could be the bowhead whale uh, that can live more than 200 years. It could be uh, the Greenland shark, which uh, could potentially live all the way up to 400 years. So then that's all uh, good and well. It means we should be able to learn some stuff from these animals, right, if we want to live a, l a long life. The problem is then, you know, a quite practical one. If you really want to learn, for instance, from a bowhead whale how to live a long life, you're not really going to be able to put it in the lab, right? So that's, uh, that's not an option. Uh, and it just turns out that there is this general rule where larger animals tend to live longer. So all the long, or at least a lot of the longest lived animals are really, really big. And that's of, of course makes it a little hard if you want to do your normal day-to-day -day laboratory research. So instead, scientists then take a, uh, took a look and said like, can we find a species that is small, but that lives a lot longer than we would expect from its size? And that turns out the naked mole rat is just a perfect uh, example because it's about the size of a mouth, uh, of a mouse, so 30, 35 grams. But a mouse in a laboratory will age and die in two to three years. A mole rat can live um, above 35 years, um, has these really cool adaptations like 
it seems to be very, very resistant uh, to getting cancer. I think it's in the tens of uh, thousands of mole rats that have been studied now, and something like six tumors ever uh, found. Whereas if you look at laboratory mice, it's something like 70 to 80% of mice have uh, some kind of tumor at the time that they die. So they either die with the cancer or from the cancer. And then it's also convenient because, you know, uh, these animals are actually related. So we have a short-lived uh, animal or short-lived animals in, in mice and rats that we already know a lot about. And then we have one of the... Um, um, and we have a, a, an animal that is uh, related to them, one of their relatives, and just that just lives way, way longer. Then you can do all these sort of comparative studies and try to find out, well, what are these adaptations that the mole rat has that makes it live so much longer? You mentioned that smaller animals tend to live longer. It's not a, an absolute golden rule there, but it, it's certainly interesting. And it leads me to a section of your book where you write about Laron syndrome. And this is a, a very small group of, of people. There's a community in Ecuador. There are other communities I across Europe, but uh, globally a very, very small number of people. And uh, well, I'll let you tell the story. It's interesting to me because I, I've been to Ecuador. I've met these people. I've met the researchers who are looking into their lives. And the, the key thing is that people with Laron syndrome tend to be, and this isn't fully understood yet, but they tend to be much less likely to get the killer diseases of old age, like cancer, like diabetes, like heart conditions. Yeah, so, so the really interesting thing about this whole si size longevity thing is that once you then has established that large animals tend to live longer than, than small animals, at least as a rule of thumb, then it actually turns out that within it, each species, this rule is flipped on its head. So small dogs live longer than big dogs. Ponies live longer than horses. The longest lived mouse ever is something called an Ames dwarf mouse, uh, which is like half the size of a normal mouse. Uh, yeah, and then naturally also people start to wonder, well, uh, is it the same thing for people? Should I be very, very sad that I'm tall or very happy that I'm small? Uh, and it does seem that we can have some uh, of the same pattern as we see in other animals. Uh, for instance, if you go to, to take a look at some of the oldest uh, lived people ever, uh, for instance, Shang Kalmin, the, uh, the longest lived person ever uh, at, the time, uh, at the moment, she was a very small uh, lady. Actually, every, every single person in the top 10 or something is a very small, like five something, five zero, uh, typically five one, four eleven. Uh, um, at the time, like before they started shrinking to uh, to old age, and then as I say, there's this uh, there's this my mouse, the Ames dwarf mouse, which is ha which has um, a dysfunction in its growth uh, hormone signaling, and we actually know also people that have dysfunctions in growth hormone signaling. The people with the uh, Laron syndrome, where the growth horm hormone receptor is uh, is non-functional, so that means these people typically have uh, normal or even high levels of growth hormone in the, in the blood, but it just can't. Uh, it just can't really interact with the cells. So you don't really get a response to this growth, growth hormone. And as a result, you get these people that are, uh, that are very, very short, but they don't display like the typical uh, characteristics that you would um, see in, in people with what we could call like normal dwarfism, where they, um, they have this, um, these special proportions with a larger head and, and uh, limbs that are, are quite short. Uh, so these people are more like a miniature version of, of you and I. Um, but then, as you say, the really interesting thing is that somehow this lack of growth signaling seems to protect them against all these different things. Uh, cancer, uh, heart disease, diabetes, even acne, it seems that they're protected against. Uh, and that's also despite, you know... Um, as I read in your account, some of them being quite overweight, uh, that's, they still seem protected, they don't get high blood pressure anyways, and stuff like that. So it does really, um, it does really suggest that there is something central about growth signaling that is just crucial in determining both your aging and then also, of course, as a byproduct of that, your risk of age-related uh, age diseases. 
Now, the uh, hormone that you're talking about is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. And people with Laron syndrome have plenty of IGF-1. It is the receptor. That, that is the area of the problem, that the receptor is, is simply not working to allow those individuals to use the IGF-1. And just to explain, IGF-1 is crucially important, especially when you're growing up as, uh, as a child, to achieve a, a normal height. And I think, and you can elaborate on this, as you're an adult, IGF-1 probably becomes less important because you're not continuing to grow. And that's the interesting area, that there are interventions, and fasting is one, that allows us to reduce our levels of, of IGF-1. And there seems to be some correlation between IGF-1 levels and the likelihood of getting cancer or these killer diseases of old age. And, and that's why, for a wider community, this area of science is so interesting. Yeah, so uh, normally, uh, normally growth hormone goes to the liver and promotes the production of IGF-1. So when the receptor doesn't work, then you just don't really uh, get that response. And as you say, that's, uh, that's the reason for the symptoms. That's also why, if, I mean, we can treat it by giving people IGF-1 and they, they will uh, then don't get this phenotype of being very, very uh, small. But, you know, from at least from a cancer perspective, this makes perfect sense uh, because cancer is fundamental, fundamentally about growth. Uh, so that if you have higher growth signaling, we would also expect um, all things equal that it could uh, put you at a higher risk of cancer. Now... Uh, from a more fundamental standpoint, why it has an effect on aging, that is uh, something that I think is absolutely fascinating because, of course, yeah, we need growth signaling to grow up uh, to attain our final uh, height and size. But from that point, you know, it, it is not as needed. You still, you still use it to maintain your muscle mass and, you know, you can't just completely sap uh, some of these hormones and, and feel feel well, but it could this could suggest at least that it would be beneficial to uh, to at least modulate these pathways uh, in old age. The problem is though that even for for a lot of years, um, taking growth hormone actually has been seen as some kind of anti aging intervention that you could do where you could uh, uh, because apparently I haven't tried it, but uh, it should feel qu quite nice uh, to take growth hormone. You feel. Uh, you feel a lot of vitality and um, you gain muscle mass and in general you could feel like this stuff is helping you uh, staying um, uh, staying young uh, but from the stuff that we can learn from laboratory animals and also the stuff that we can see with Leron patients this is probably not the best thing you could do for yourself in, in old age uh, um, so there is this connection but at this point I think at least it's a little hard to say exactly why uh, and how this stuff works. And the other kicker in this story is that people with Laron syndrome tend not to live excessively long lives. They tend to die at about the same age as, as their peers, as other people in their families and, and their local community. And uh, the, the reasons for that are not fully understood. They, they are small people. They suffer more road accidents than most people in their community. That might be obvious because if they're crossing a road and, and it's dark, they can't be seen. It could be as simple as that. They also tend to have a higher level of alcoholism than others in their community and, and depression as well. And that depression may well be caused because they are short and because they're small and they don't want to be, they want to be normal. They want to be the normal height of, of everyone else. So. I don't know what this tells us. Uh, perhaps it tells us that uh, there's clearly more than one factor that goes into longevity. It is about the whole body. And clearly for Laurent syndrome people, one of the issues is to get IGF-1, especially for their children, to encourage growth in the early part of their lives. And, and IGF-1 is expensive and it's not always possible to, to get supplies in, in the places that it's needed. So this is a complicated area, isn't it? It's... Uh I'm absolutely certain that there is also a mental health aspect of this. We we do know that, uh, you know, your physical health, health and your mental health is, of course, um, inter, intertwined. It's not something that you can separate. So even 
if you have all these, you could call them physical advantages for, for longevity, if you don't feel well, uh, that might negate some of it. And of course, it's of course completely understandable that these people, you know, maybe even if people don't want, like, maybe even if people are not trying to do so, you will just get looked at maybe a little differently from from sticking out so much but by being like uh, curiously small so then you could uh, completely understand why some of these people would then uh, not feel not feel well and uh, and for that reason maybe maybe um from the loneliness or the stress com uh, coming from this stuff then and the alcoholism not live as long uh, as they could have, uh, because for, of course, if if you do a similar experiment with mice, there's not this whole social factor, or at least uh, the social factor is a lot, uh, a lot less complicated than than it is in humans. So we do ha have all this extra stuff that just makes uh, that just makes the biology of aging even more complicated when you're talking about humans uh, compared to when uh, you're just talking about an animal like a mouse. Nevertheless, the science is, is fascinating and it, it brings me on to the section in your book you talk about fasting and, and the work of Dr. Walter Longo here in Los Angeles at uh, USC, uh, who of course is very closely related to the research that's going on with uh, the Laurent syndrome communities in Ecuador and there's a very definite link between uh, the kind of research that he's doing here and uh, what we've seen in those communities and the research here is focused around the, the, the fasting mimicking diet and one of I've already mentioned one of the um, the side effects of fasting is that your IGF-1 levels come down lots of other effects as well I'm curious to know what you think about fasting again it's one of those buzzwords these days isn't it everyone seems to be fasting whether it's an intermittent fast or a periodic fast or time restricted eating is is another one that a lot of people are doing do you think there's much in this in terms of the science yeah so for for one like the the whole um, calorie restriction uh, field if you could call it that like calorie restriction is the most reliable way to to prolong the life of laboratory rodents at least uh, but that's just you know not entirely practical to transfer to humans like don't eat uh, and then you might live a, a few years longer like just uh, by starving yourself your whole life that's just uh, even if it's true uh, i doubt that we will ever find out in humans if it is true but even if it is uh, not a lot of people would make uh, would make the the um the choice so instead the interesting thing about fasting in my eyes is that it's a way to replicate some of the, uh, of this because it does seem that at least some of the benefits seen in calorie restriction um studies actually comes from the fasting not just from the lower amount of calories uh, and of course, it's much more doable to fast. They can even feel uh, good. So, I mean, it's something that I do myself occasionally. I'm not, um, I'm not over uh, sealers on it. I would say I'm not uh, someone that fasts every day, for instance. Uh, but I do like to do it twice a week. Um, and the research that at least I've seen uh, seems to suggest that if you skip a meal, it should be the dinner so you should get more of your calories early in the day as opposed to loading your calories late in the day so i confirmed it a little bit a, a little um kind of like a self-experiment i can just see at least on my uh, aura ring that if i eat within like three hours of going to bed i tend to sleep uh, sleep worse and just in general it seems um it seems logical this thing about then having like cutting out dinner instead of cutting out breakfast yeah, I do a very similar sort of regime and that's probably one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. I stop eating at five or six when it is practical to do so and generally have a, a much better night's sleep. But you write about uh, Roy Walford as well, which is something else I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet Roy Walford uh, a couple of decades ago and it was towards the end of his career and he's a, a fascinating character isn't he because he is one of the original researchers really that that kick-started the whole interest in in longevity and and especially caloric restriction but I think the the message that comes through from a lot of his work is that you know he went to an extreme and an extreme that a tiny number of people could actually tolerate in their real lives 
Yeah, so, I mean, absolutely fascinating character, uh, in my opinion. I do sometimes, uh, you know, when you look back at least um, a few decades, it does seem like you had more of these, you know, I guess you could call them crazy scientists, where, you know, experimenting on yourself, having all these crazy ideas going on in expeditions and, and so on. And there's just something... I don't know, there's something pure about that that I just really, really like. Uh, and yeah, it's it's true, you know, he he was very much into longevity and he didn't uh, he didn't get to live that long uh, himself, but at least, you know, he was uh, he was kickstarting this all of this stuff for other people to then follow up and I'm actually thinking that you know, the the same thing with us uh, today. There's a lot of people I know that are talking about soon we will be able to control aging i don't think i i entirely buy that i mean i would certainly be happy about that but we don't know if that's going to be our own role as well like the people studying this stuff today if we are actually going to be able to reap the fruit of some of this stuff or if we are one of the last generations uh, just like someone like roy walford who won't actually you know see the full potential realized but at least will have contributed some of the the foundation that you know other people will then benefit from. You mentioned your own experiments with fasting and time restricted eating and, and how it affects you and how it affects your sleep. I'm, I'm curious more generally in terms of your research, has it affected the way that you live your life? It, it must have done everything that you've learned in, in terms of applying well, it. Well I try to apply all of this stuff to myself. Uh, first of all because I mean Academic science is a lot of fun uh, as a career, but it's also just fun, you know, sometimes kind of being a little egoistic and just focusing on yourself, studying what, you know, I think is one of the weirdest things about the modern age that we know so little actually about what's going on in our own bodies at any given time. So I think it's really interesting uh, both to try to optimize things, but also just to see you know, what is my actual genetics like? What is my microbiome like? How is my sleep? How is my uh, heart rate throughout the day? And so on and so on. So I really, really like these uh, these things in general. And then, of course, also one of the initial things once I um, started getting into this whole field is also, of course, for, for my own benefit of trying to see what can I do? I'm really interested in, in uh, you know, being as uh, well as I can be especially um, when you start out with this stuff as a young person I, I mean I'm very happy about how I feel in my own body today so if I could keep feeling this way uh, and not have this decline that you tend to see in other people that would just be absolutely amazing so uh, yeah I tend to do a lot of uh, experiments uh, on myself um, not as in taking random drugs but in trying to see how I can optimize uh, the few parameters that I'm absolutely certain should be optimized uh, very tightly to, to get a longer life. And I think as someone in their 20s, this makes you quite unusual because generally I find that people who are, are not longevity researchers really don't think about their, their health or, or their potential longevity to any great depth. You're young, you're focused on your life and your career. And you're going to live forever, maybe not literally, but it's not something to think about. It's not something to think about the diseases that you might see in your grandparents or even your great grandparents if you're that young. My frustration sometimes is that if only people at a younger age would think about their longevity and perhaps some of the interventions that could be applied, that it could improve generally their health span and potentially their lifespan. Absolutely. I mean, there is the one, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the ITP, the Interventions Testing Program. I would say one of the, the very optimistic or very positive news we've gotten from there is that a lot of gyro, um protective agents, so a lot of these molecules that are tested for their anti-aging abilities, seem to at least have some effect even if you start them late. Some of them might even have the same effect whether you start them kind of late in life or at midlife or whether you start them from a young age. So I would say there's great hope, but of course it is always 
better uh, to not damage yourself and do not accumulate this damage and, the, and then try to fix it. You know, it's, it's a lot better to just not get the damage from the beginning and, and start when you're young. Uh, try to, to keep all the stuff that you, you have, uh, of course. One of the things about longevity research is that, especially if you're involving human beings, it's actually very difficult to do. Certainly experiments involving a lot of people where they're dependent on results that might occur decades in the future. And, and clearly that's why laboratory animals are used, that's why fruit flies are used because their lifespan is, is quite short. And I think that's coming back to the experiments that you conduct on yourself as an N equals one, do, just like I do, looking at my sleep and comparing it with the diet or the exercise I've had the day before. That makes that kind of experimentation, even though more broadly speaking in the scientific world, it may not have any great value because you're just one person. I think for ourselves, it is of value. I mean, definitely. And the, you know, the problem also is sometimes in a study, if you read that this or, this, uh, this or that agent improves some score by 20%, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has a 20% e increase in what you're looking at. It means that that's, you know, the average uh, increase. Maybe some people even, you know, had a huge benefit and other people didn't get any benefit at all or even were harmed by this stuff. So. Of course, we want to learn general stuff. We want to get a medicine that can be used to improve. Uh, but I think if you're really, really serious about this stuff, you don't get around doing stuff where you test what helps and doesn't help yourself in particular. I mean, that is not, of course, for everyone to optimize everything like this. But if, if you really, really want to, uh, uh, to take this to the next level, you have to know a lot about what's going on in your own body for sure. And of all of the potential interventions, and they come into three or four broad categories, there's diet, there's exercise, there's sleep, and there's mental health, which you mentioned earlier. Is there a pecking order there? Is there one thing that's more important to the other? Or is it really a case of we are a whole body and it's all important? Yes, so... Of course, there's the whole don't smoke, uh, which would be the number one, because it's like uh, probably the worst thing you could do for yourself for longevity. But I mean, if you're generally a healthy person, I would say that you have to, you have to, um, to start out by, by doing all that you can do in these, you know, even some people think it's a little boring, you know, like th focusing on my diet, focusing on my exercise, my sleep. I want some pill that I can take. I want to do some crazy experiment of, you know, diving into cold water or uh, being a blood donor or whatever, all this uh, stuff that you can try. And that's all good and well, but I wouldn't say you could rank these, but um, maybe 80% 80, uh, 80 healthy on the diet. Um, getting a little bit of exercise, uh, especially aerobic exercise, making sure you sleep well, and then only then you can start to actually look at the other stuff, you know, making sure you have a healthy weight as well would be another thing. And do you have a, a vision of your own longevity? Clearly this is the subject, the number one subject for you to think about in terms of your academic research, but at a very personal level, do you think about yourself and maybe what you can do now to have an impact on your life in your 50s, your 70s, your 90s, and who knows, as a centenarian? Well, I don't have the best starting point being a man, first of all, so that would uh, uh, already take a few years out. And then uh, for some weird reason, and it's not something that's included in the English book, but in the Danish book, Denmark just tends to have a really weirdly low life expectancy so much lower than the other scandinavian countries uh, some of the list we are aligned with something like slovenia which uh, you know all due respect to slovenia but a country that is way way poorer than us uh, where people have higher average bmis where they smoke more and all this stuff but still you know it's not it doesn't seem to be the best starting point to be a danish man if you want to live a long life that being said of course you know uh, I don't have a specific number, uh, so depending on how it goes, maybe maybe hundred would be would be incredible. Maybe that would be nothing when we get to that point, and my goal should really be two hundred or three hundred. Who knows? Uh, so I don't have a specific number, but of course I'm doing this also because I hope it's gonna 
uh, give me something uh, in my life. And once you uh, complete your studies, what are your immediate ambitions? Well, I'm doing my PhD right now. Uh, then I have my book that is out in 26 different countries. And, you know, I get to speak to people from all over the world. And um, yeah, right now, I mean, you never know. Uh, I don't know where the best place to do, have an impact would be if it is to continue in academia or if it is to go to industry. So I haven't decided that, but it seems I feel pretty fortunate with what I have right now with my book and also my research uh, and being able to combine that. So honestly, if I could just continue like this, uh, I have another book coming out in Danish here in, in September and have a lot of other ideas I want to write about. So that would, uh, that would be an amazing career in, uh, in my eyes. And then of course, um, I want to, uh, I want to contribute a lot of uh, original research as well. So that's what I'm also focusing on, of course, on my, uh, on my PhD. And actually, think bring us closer to understanding what aging even is, because I think that's uh, still a big open question that we need to answer. I think it's a great question and a potentially very exciting career. Nicholas, thank you so much. It's a great book. Thoroughly recommend it. Really good to talk to you. Thank you for having me.